I'm driving home one night in, uh, from the airport in Albany, and there's this little sign that says, Up Yonda Farm. Up Yonda. U-P-Y-O-N-D-A. No idea what this is. No clue. Go home. Go online. Oh my gosh. This is this very cool community and, and training center to train people. And you're going to tell us more in a minute, Peter. I'm going to have you come on up. This is Peter Olaszewski, who is local here, <laughs> who is the Up Yonda guy from Up Yonda Farms. Farm. Farm. Singular. One Singular. farm. Yep. One farm. So they do remarkable work in our local community, which I'm learning about with you tonight. I know this much. And I'm just so excited to have him teach me this much. And I know you have a little more space. So thank you. Thank you for coming, Peter, to join us. Thank you for having me. Have at it. And you know how to do your slide yes. thing, right? Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is uh, a huge pleasure for me to be here. My name is Peter Olaszewski, uh, I, and I am a naturalist or environmental educator at Up Yonder Farm, which is a small county-run environmental education center just over the mountain in Bolton Landing, uh, another beautiful little lake shore community here around Lake George. Um, I, I really, today, unlike some of the other speakers, uh, I'm not so much here to tell my life story. Um, I will talk a little bit about myself, but really what I'm going to be doing today is sharing the story about two amazing people uh, whose names are Alice and John Scott, and, and they are the benefactors of our little Nature Center in Bolton. But uh, I know we've heard a lot of great speakers today, and, and uh, we haven't had a lot of time to kind of move around and stretch and things like that. So uh, Rick's asked me to maybe start with something that could maybe show you what type of education or what type of things we're offering at Up Yonda Farm. And uh, so I, I'd like everyone to kind of stand up here for a minute. How many of you are familiar with the Eastern Bluebird? Hopefully everyone. Uh, how many of you are from New York? If you're from New York, you definitely should know this bird. It is our state bird here in New York, so the, East, the Eastern Bluebird. Um, anytime we have a group of students, whether they be preschoolers, right up through maybe fifth or sixth grade, could have a group of adults, um, you know, we have, we have an option. We can show them a picture like this, and I can stand in front of them for a few minutes and say, this is the eastern bluebird. You can see its bright blue colors. This is a migratory bird. It eats bugs. And I can do things that way. But what we choose to do is try and find ways to make it a little more uh, fun, a little more enjoyable. And it's amazing how much more people will learn and remember when we do it that way. So uh, what I want to share with you is, is a little bit about these birds, and when they return from their migration uh, from down south back to New York every spring, they're what we call a cavity nester. You guys know what cavities are? It can be a, an old hole in, in an old growth tree, something like that, or it can be a house like this, which we sometimes build with our groups. But uh, the behavior of these eastern bluebirds is kind of interesting. The male bluebirds, the ones that are extremely bright blue on the back, bright orange, on the belly, they are the first to return. And it is their job to seek out a nest box. And then their goal is to try and attract a female bluebird to come and make a house or make a nest inside that particular box. So we are all going to be male bluebirds for a second, all right? So you've got. A nice house like this, you arrive back, it's late March, sometimes, depending on the weather, maybe uh, early April. And you're a male bluebird, you find a box, you think this is, the, this is the best place to make a nest, and now we've got to attract a mate. So we're going to do something called a wing wave, all right? a wing wave. Well, they do this wing wave, they're also going to be singing a song. If I get this close enough to my mic, you should be able to hear it. Everybody say, cheer, cheerful charmer. Cheer, cheerful charmer. Fantastic. Now, when you say that, I want you to slowly raise one arm. Say, cheer, cheerful charmer. Cheer, cheerful charmer. And then kind of let that wing flutter down. Now do the other side. Cheer, cheerful charmer. Let, 
let that wing flutter down. Now everybody, I'm going to be careful doing this up here, everybody hop and face the opposite direction. And we're going to do it again. Cheer, cheerful charmer. One more time, other side, cheer, cheerful charmer. And then go ahead and hop and face the front again. Now this male bluebird, this male bluebird will do this wing wave, he'll sing his song, he'll do this wing wave on top of this box until he can attract a female bluebird. When she shows interest, she'll come close. He usually flies down to the ground or if there's a nearby tree to watch and she'll go inside and she'll look around. <laughs> Unfortunately for our male bluebird, nine times out of 10, probably more like 99 times out of 100, she's gonna go in and quickly come right back out and fly back to whatever perch she came from. And that tells the male bluebird, you've got a mate, but you don't, we, this box isn't gonna cut it. <laughs> For what could be as much as maybe four or five weeks, the male bluebird will check cavity after cavity or box after box doing the same display, that wing wave, singing his song saying, hey, here I am, I found a place to live, come check it out. And time after time, the female will check it and she just won't be satisfied with it. <laughs> Until finally, one day, her sort of maternal instincts will kick in and she'll realize that it's starting to get later in the spring and they need to go ahead and build a nest. So finally, finally, that female bluebird will go in, she'll look around, and she'll stay inside. She just kind of lets out a sigh and says, fine, whatever, this'll do. <laughs> so, before, Bluebirds do not mate for life, they mate seasonally. So when they all go, to, go south in the fall and, and then the males return, they're potentially gonna be with a different mate each spring, but as soon as he can attract that first female, they're gonna stay together. Yep, she's gonna follow him to house to house to house for, again, could be, could be four or five weeks. So one more time before I let everybody sit down, let's try that wing wave one more time. Cheer, cheerful charmer, let it flutter down. Show off those feathers one more time. Yeah. Cheer, cheerful charmer. Thank you guys, you can go ahead and sit down. All right. Now if I can save, if I can save enough time, there is another little activity that I, I wanna share with you at the end. Um, but again, what I really came today to talk about is, uh, is again, not so much myself, but uh, about these, these two people, Alice and John Scott. Uh, this is a, a really what I find to be an amazing sort of inspiring story. And uh, I am gonna be using some notes up here, those of you that know me, which is really no one here, I guess. Um, you'll know me a little better by the time I'm done. Um, I, I can tend to be a little bit long-winded, and so I find if, if I have some nice notes, I can refer to those. I wanna try to avoid Jess having to come up here and yank me off with a, a shepherd's hook, okay? So what I wanna do is I want you guys to kind of go back with me in your minds. Try to imagine a time uh, about 80 years ago, actually 80 years ago this summer. Go back with me to the summer of 1933 in the little lakefront town of Bolton Landing, New York. This was a time when, uh, you know, up Bolton Landing, it was, it, there were always people there. Uh, I mean, people had settled there all the way back in the 1700s, but it was just starting to become sort of a tourist destination. It was a time when many well-to-do families were, were sort of flocking to the Lake George area, looking for you know, places or, or ways to escape their busy lives in, in places like New York City. So they would come on the weekends or they would, they would come during the summers and they would even start to buy uh, or build some, some seasonal residences. That summer, the summer of 1933, uh, a young man originally from Ontario, Canada, uh, known for having a, a love of the outdoors and a passion for world travel, uh, would be introduced to a bright young woman from Staten Island 
who, uh, who also had a, a love for the natural world, and uh, that included a, a passion for wildlife and, and animals and, and gardening, actually. Having so much in common, when the two met, they, they really hit it off, and before long, the two would be married. Within 10 years, Alice and John Scott would actually come to settle for good in the place where they had met, Bolton Landing. Taking up residence on an old farmstead called Up Yonder Farm, uh, which Alice's mother had originally purchased, again, as a seasonal re re retreat for her daughters in 1932. Now, let me deviate for a second. We get it, the question a lot, up beyond a farm. Where did that name ever come from? The truth is, you know, I, I can't take any credit for it. Uh, the county, even Alice and John Scott did not come up with the name. Uh, there have been five owners of this particular property going all again all the way back to the, the late 1700s. Um, it was one of the middle owners, second or third owner, uh, a man named Dr. Willie Meyer. And he was a, a wealthy uh, surgeon from New York City. And he bought, and he actually only owned the property for maybe six years or so, and then he, he uh, eventually passed away. And his estate is where Alice's mother bought it, bought the property for about $6,000, which is kind of, kind of amazing in, in today's terms. But um, when Dr. Willie Meyer owned the property, it was exactly that, a seasonal retreat, some place where he could go to escape. And it's said that any time he was preparing to come up to the Adirondacks, he would tell all of his friends in New York that he was getting ready to visit his farm up yonder. And uh, at some point, someone said, hey, that's, that's pretty catchy. And uh, he had a little sign made, which I think we still have somewhere. So that's where the name comes from. Now, uh, for nearly 50 years, Alice and John Scott would call up Yonder Farm their home. And during that time, they really put their heart and soul into their property. Using the knowledge that Alice had garnered uh, from her botany studies at Vassar College, they created many beautiful flower gardens, most of which we've tried to preserve and still exist today, uh, and which further enhanced the natural beauty of this piece of property. Alice also attended Cornell University, where she received a degree in poultry science, and utilizing a, an existing barn, an old, an old barn, the Scots began raising Rhode Island red chickens uh, and selling their eggs to the local residents and to the local railroad. So as time went by, the Scots, they would become friends with many of the, the people who lived in Bolton year-round and with a lot of seasonal visitors. Uh, and more and more people were beginning to sort of stop by their farm. Sometimes it was, you know, to, to just take a walk, maybe enjoy the natural setting. Sometimes it was with the request to hike up. There, there's a large open field. Uh, they, they would walk up and pick wildflowers or maybe blueberries, things like that. So uh, the Scots were sort of ever ambitious. They, they were always kind of into something. And they quickly realized that this beautiful piece of property that they owned and they enjoyed so much, so near to the shore of Lake George, would actually be a, a highly desirable vacation destination for some people. Uh, and they actually started what would become a very successful cabin rental business. They built three or four small little sort of you know, one-room cabins. Um, and that did really well for them. As that really started to take off and more and more people started to come to the Lake George region, they actually saw yet another opportunity. And they actually began selling real estate, selling property or, or, or homes around the lake, and thereby actually were able to amass you know, a, nice little, a nice little fortune. But you know, for as much money as they, they had, at a time when, you know, again, the, the, her parents, her mother bought the property for $6,000, and at last check, it's now valued at you know, several million dollars, something like that. So at a time when, when what they had was, was actually a fair amount of money, it, it never really seemed to matter all that much to them. They, they never really seemed to care too much about the money. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but the Scots never had children. They, they never had any children. And the money that was made from all of their various ventures would actually go 
into the property, a lot of it. Um, it would be used to support hobbies, like John Scott uh, was known to be an avid photographer and, and, and was really into to that. Um, and to buy Alice the, uh, the best, kind of most state-of-the-art appliances. Um, she always had to have, you know, the, the newest, most expensive vacuum, and, and they had, you know, dishwashers before anybody else in the town did, and all of those things. That those, those things were important to her. Um, but it also allowed the Scotts to do things that they enjoyed as a couple. And, and probably the thing they enjoyed most to do together was travel. They would travel the world. Over the years, they would visit many places in the western U.S., um, actually Hawaii several times. They, they seemed to really like the, the warm weather there. And, uh, and then they would go overseas to Europe, places like Spain and Portugal and the Netherlands. Um, as the Scots traveled and as they aged, they really began to understand or, or, or realize, I guess, that this piece of property they had in Bolton Landing, it, it was valuable. It had a lot of potential. They began to understand what it meant to have such a large, relatively undeveloped track of land in what was quickly becoming a very overdeveloped, some might even say an overcrowded sort of tourist area around Lake George. The truth is, eventually, Alice and John Scott would become disgusted by the seemingly endless development occurring around the lake. And as they approached the final chapter of their lives, they became increasingly concerned about the ultimate fate of this piece of property, this, of, of up yonder farm, upon their passing. Through wise investments in the stock market, and again, through their many business ventures, Alice and John, you know, again, they'd accumulated a, a fair amount of wealth, and they decided that when they did finally leave this earth, that they would leave their beloved property and a trust fund of about $3 million to Warren County so that the Parks and Recreation Department could transform it into an environmental education center, thus preserving the land in its undeveloped state and ensuring that future generations would be able to enjoy it as much as they had. John Scott passed away in 1990 at the age of 88, and Alice in October of 1993 at the age of 93. Just prior to her passing, Alice wrote a statement entitled, Thoughts on the Lake, which explained her decision not to leave up yonder in private hands. And forgive me, I am a little bit out of my realm today, normally speaking to school groups and smaller groups. I completely forgot that Rick gave me this thing, and I have a <laughs> slideshow behind me. We'll get, we'll get caught up here. So this is, this is actually a view from our hill at up yonder. This is the, it's kind of hard to see, but this is, this is the field that I described where people would go and pick berries and wildflowers. And at the bottom, you can kind of make out a little white farmhouse where they would have lived. Uh, here's an older photo uh, of the farmhouse itself. And there's a little bit of a, a man-made pond sort of here. And then her garden, some of them uh, are around the pond and then kind of on both sides of the drive that goes up the front. Again, you know, they, they used their money to, to buy the things that they enjoyed, and they always seemed to have nice cars and, and things, nice appliances. Um, in the background there, you can see some of the barns that I described. I think I've got, uh, there's Alice herself. Um, it was actually interesting to hear Bob say that he had worked uh, for Macy's. Um, Alice was one of the first uh, women I was told, to, to work in their housewares department in Macy's. And uh, she, um, she definitely, she, she was a homemaker, and she, she liked that, and she loved to garden. She was very meticulous. And again, we've tried to preserve a lot of those, those gardens so that you can, you can still come and see those. Uh, this is not a great shot. We'll see this again later. Uh, this is, again, one of her gardens. It is now what we know as the Alice and John Scott Memorial Garden. It would actually be transformed into a, a little bit of a memorial to them. There's the barn. The, this, is, this is the barn where they ro uh, raised the Rhode Island Red Chickens. It was actually a two-story chicken coop. Um, 
And that, that's kind of what it looked like. Maybe it was a, even in a little worse shape when the county got their hands on it. And, and again, you'll see what it turned into here in a little bit. There's the second barn. Although Alice and John Scott never raised cattle, the owners before them did. And there might have even been a time when uh, they leased part of their field or part of their property to, to other folks in Bolton who needed grazing areas for their cattle. So that's, this would become a natural history museum. There's a shot of the little up yonder farm sign. And then again, uh, a shot of their real estate sign out front. Um, all right, now I'm caught up. So just before she passed away, Alice, she, she wanted to try and, and put into words why she and her husband had decided to, to leave this property, not, not in private hands. Although they never had children, they, they had some relatives that they were fairly close with, and they could have easily left it to them. But instead, uh, they chose to leave it to Warren County to make it a public facility that anyone and everyone could come and enjoy. So I'd like to read that to you guys right now. Uh, thoughts on the lake. It says, since acquiring up yonder in 1993 for a summer residence, I loved it so much that I finally made it my permanent home. It has been a great privilege to enjoy the land and this historic old house for so many years. Over the years, I've seen many changes here. These changes are not all for the better. In fact, I've watched what I call the desecration of the land around us with heartache, including the lake. Good shot of Lake George there. As much as we have loved this area, we feel we want to share it with future generations. I strongly feel that a great part of people's troubles are due to the fact that they have no space and are huddled together. To a large extent, the state land has saved us from complete spoilage. But up yonder is the last open space on the Bolton Road. The view from our hill is matchless. We feel there is a need for an escape from the commercialism where people can walk and enjoy nature. We have had many people walk up our hill and thank us for the beauty that we have preserved. When I first lived here, it was my delight to roam through the woods, on the lake shore, and everywhere. But now there is nothing like that left. So in leaving this property and its upkeep to the county, I hope that they will cherish what we have done and use it to its best possible advantage, to develop nature trails, encourage wildlife and education, and to just simply enjoy. May 1st, 1994, arrived on the calendar, and Warren County Parks and Recreation employees arrived at Up Yonda Farm. There's a, there's a shot of Alice and John, uh, I think from 89 or 90, just before John passed away. So May 1st, 1994, was the first time that the county and their workers could set foot on the property. And when they did, they began what, what would become a, a three-year conversion from an old homestead into an environmental education center. Some of the existing buildings uh, would be demolished, some of those smaller cabins and things that were not in, in great shape. Uh, but others would be transformed or redesigned including those two barns that I showed you earlier. They would be transformed into a state-of-the-art auditorium and a natural history museum. So there's another shot of that two-story chicken coop, that first barn. And then uh, the, work, the worker you saw there, we actually had to raise these buildings up. We had to pour new, put new foundations under them. And then the insides were gutted and, and sort of redone. So there's a shot of the outside. And then I think I have a shot of the inside. And so now we can use it as, as sort of a classroom for those groups that visit us. Bless you. Here is the, the second barn, the, the cattle barn. And that was transformed into a natural history museum. It's kind of a shot of the outside entranceway. The natural history museum, probably our, our uh, favorite part of that particular building is what you're seeing here. This is a Four Seasons diorama. Um, it, was, it took a long time to create, um, to kind of
trying to find or collect all the different animal specimens, but there are about 40 different native Adirondack species that are portrayed here, um, and we use this for many of the programs that we do, and it's sort of a, sort of a big hit, especially with the younger audiences. Existing gardens and walking trails would be enhanced on the property, and a new group of environmental educators would arrive and begin making plans for both school and group programs to be conducted on site. Oop, there's a shot, close-up shot of one of, our, one of our animals there. Not every day you get to stand that close to a deer or a bear, something like that. In June of 1997, Up Yonder Farm officially opened to the public uh, as a nature center, and since then, our staff has worked tirelessly to preserve the legacy left behind by Alice and John Scott to ensure that their gift for future generations would not be forgotten. One of the existing perennial gardens, which you'll see here, this is sort of the whole trail map and some of the things we have to offer. Um, shot of one of our signs. Here it is. To ensure that their gift would be, you know, remembered, this particular garden, with the help of the Lake George Garden Club, was transformed into a memorial for Alice and John Scott, and a commemorative plaque actually placed on a stone uh, so that visitors can see that and remember uh, their gift. And again, you know, it's just about everyone who visits we try to send them down and so they can see this garden and so that they can learn about the Scots. Those who visit today also have the opportunity to hike to Alice and John's final resting place, uh, which is actually located uh, sort of in the back corner of Federal Hill Cemetery, uh, which sits adjacent to the Up Yonder Farm property and only minutes from that amazing view of Lake George from the top of their hill. Currently as a nature center, uh, our mission is to preserve the natural landscape and to educate others about the beauty and importance of the environment. And we do that through hands-on learning and real-life experiences, things like, like we did earlier. Since 1997, Up Yonder has developed a fantastic reputation. We're really proud to say that uh, we're known for providing high-quality educational programming. Many teachers have used us for years and, and, and hopefully will continue to use us. Uh, we're also proud to say that over the last 16 years, our staff has been able to provide these educational programs to nearly 150,000 people. Mostly school-aged children, either on site and, and actually uh, in more recent times with school budgets and things being slashed, we've started to go off-site. We've started to get out into the communities and into the schools, libraries, places like that to make sure that they're getting our message we're also happy that 16 years after its inception, uh, visitors from all over the capital region, sometimes further away, are still able to come on the weekends and during the summer to enjoy our nature programs, hike the trails, see the indoor and outdoor exhibits. Here's a shot of our, our nature, one of our nature programs. We have a small pond again on site, big hit with the kids. One of the groups, they, oh, they don't look that happy to be there, though, do they? <laughs> that one doesn't. We are open all season, four seasons, and uh, snowshoeing is a big hit in the wintertime. We also have a small sugar shack on site, so we make maple syrup. And, uh, of course, you can't really leave without sampling it, so everyone generally enjoys that. Here's a shot of one of those outreach programs that I described, going into schools, taking uh, things with us, and, and teaching really about anything and everything that has to do with nature. This one happens to be uh, a program on stars. This is Star Lab, an indoor inflatable planetarium. So we can teach about constellations and things. Um, I will mention that later this summer, once in July and once in August, Silver Bay has invited me to come back with Star Lab and do some programs here on site. So looking forward to that. Kind of a shot of one of our hiking trails. And then as far as 
our exhibits go, one of the big attractions during the summertime is our butterfly garden. It's a 60 foot by 40 foot netted enclosure that we rear the butterflies in and you can walk through, look for caterpillars, the butterflies sometimes land on you. Uh, again, it's a, it's a big attraction. So people, we're happy to say, are, are still coming and enjoying these things and we hope that they'll continue to do that. I hope that if anyone you know, it has the time, either now or on a future visit, that you yourselves will, will come and, and visit our, our facility and, and see all that it has to offer. When it comes to the nature programs we offer, again, you know, we pride ourselves on fun and incorporating fun into it. And uh, I think I've got a few minutes left. So I said there was, there was another little activity that I wanted to do, but this one's gonna require a volunteer. Somebody, somebody that needs to be brave. Okay. Come on up, Gina. All right, so since we were There's just, no snakes, no snakes in this, I promise, no. <laughs> since we're looking at some images of our butterfly garden and since butterflies is a topic that I have an opportunity to teach about quite often, uh, I wanted to share one of the ways that we try and impart the sort of anatomy of a butterfly or what makes a butterfly a butterfly, if you will. And uh, there's really no better way to do that than to transform someone into a butterfly. So, I'm sure you all know butterflies are insects, they're bugs. They have three main body parts. They have a head, they have a thorax, the middle section, and they have an abdomen. Let's start with Gina, Gina's head. What does she need on her head to be a butterfly? <laughs> she needs antennas. I have a little box. I have a little box of parts back here. Somewhere. Where are they? I lost them. There they are. All right. So we'll let you put those on. I apologize if they're a, a little small, but. So we can see her clubbed antennas. Sometimes we, we forget whether we're talking about butterflies or moths. There's a really easy way to remember if you're, what you're looking at is a butterfly. If it has little clubs on the end of its antennas, it's going to be a butterfly. If it's a moth, everybody put your arms like you're on a roller coaster. Moths either have straight antennas or put your thumbs down on top of your head and wiggle the rest of your fingers. Sometimes moths have feathery antennas, big feathers. Right? All right, what else does she need on her head or face to make her a butterfly? She needs a proboscis, and her proboscis, <laughs> before I can give her a proboscis, it's, it's sort of attached. Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Proboscis is, is just a fancy word for a tongue. It's a very long tongue used to sip nectar out of flowers. But before I give her that, there's something kind of on either side, and it's going to actually support our proboscis today. Gina, you have lovely eyes, but I'm afraid they're not quite big enough. <laughs> Bugs have very big eyes. I was told that if I was a butterfly as large as I am, my eyes would be the size of grapefruits. So, well, I don't have grapefruits, but I do have some very stylish glasses. And in the middle, you'll notice that sort of curly black thing. That that is to represent her tongue or her proboscis. <laughs> that takes care of her head. Let's move to the middle section, the thorax. That is the strongest part of the bug's body. It has to be strong because there are lots of little pieces attached to it. Tend to be exact. What's attached to the middle of the body? Anybody know? <laughs> Got to have wings. Now, butterflies actually have four wings. Most insects have four wings. And I happen to have a beautiful set of wings for you, Gina. Kind of like we're putting our coat on here. I think we need to try and slip an arm in there. And we'll get that all the way up. And then if you reach around, there's one for the other side. Perfect. And we'll open those up just like that. So we have four wings that leave six of something else. What do all bugs have six of? Legs. 
You have two of your own. You have two arms. We'll count those. And I just happen to have two extra bug legs with me. Yep. And I don't want you to laugh too much. I made these myself. All right. Arms up for me. Don't mind the reach. Yeah, you're good. And then I think I'll just tie it. Okay. Yeah, it'll be quicker and easier. Ah, you know what? I'll thread it. Probably be easier. Perfect. Awesome. So two, four, six legs. Six legs and four wings. Ten things all attached to. Uh oh. Wings are, you know what, we've got these. You can actually sort of steer them a little bit with these. I think so. There you go. <laughs> All right, and that leaves one more body part, which was the abdomen. And that is generally, on a butterfly, sort of a long, skinny part on the end. It's kind of hard to come up with you know, something for that, but we tried. And so we made this funny looking thing. So one more time. And this one I think is longer, so I'll just tie going to have some long strings hanging down. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Gina, the world's largest monarch butterfly. Take a spin for us. As you can imagine, as much as you all seem to enjoy doing this, when you have a group of preschoolers, they really go nuts for things like this. It's part of what makes my job fun, you know, and again, these children who go through these programs, anyone who goes through these programs, they tend to remember this stuff so much better because they're doing it in a way that's sort of fun and hands-on. Let's give Gina a huge round of applause. Thank you. We'll transform her back. Abdomen, thank you. Legs. Do I have to give you back your antenna? I'm afraid so. <laughs> thank you again. Thank, thank you, thank you so very much. much. <laughs> Jess is going to show me the wrap cue here pretty quick. So I just have a few sort of sort of final thoughts. You know, this weekend, you've all been here at Silver Bay. And you've been hearing from many world-class speakers um, and learning about amazing people. And as Rick and, and uh, Chuck like to say, about these game changers. I don't pretend to know everything about the bigger game just yet, although I'm definitely intrigued and do plan to learn more. Um, but I don't think there's any doubt that Alice and John Scott were exactly that. They were game changers. Educators like myself, who have had the privilege to learn about the Scots and their story, uh, and to work, teach it up yonder farm, we're simply trying to play the game that they created, um, a game they created for us. It, it's, a, it's a game I personally didn't set out to play. Um, I mean, you can ask my parents. Uh, they sometimes wonder if that money they spent you know, $120,000 education, whether I'm ever going to use it or not. Um, but I believe that I was sort of called to up yonder um, so that I could help to further the Scots legacy. Since coming to work there as an intern uh, in, the, in May of 2001, I've learned so much about the natural world and the importance of trying to preserve it. I truly am inspired by the Scots and the foresight they showed wanting to leave this property to Warren County and, and ensure that it was available for future generations. Before every program or presentation I give, and I did it a lot before this one, I try to remind myself just how important the work that I, I've been doing really is and that I must really try hard to convey my passion and love for nature with my audiences in hopes that maybe they too will be inspired and it may lead them to become environmental stewards as well. I honestly feel that over the years, you know, I've come to love up yonder farm just as much as Alice and John Scott did, and it's always going to have a special place in my heart. 
Someone once asked me if I thought the Scots would be happy uh, with the way that things have turned out, with the way that the county has, has sort of transformed and continues to use the property. And I think the answer is undoubtedly yes. And I'm very, very proud of that fact. Um, I'm really thankful for Alice and John Scott for their gift, again, to, to the future, the future generations. And uh, I want to thank all of you for listening to their story. If you do get a chance, please come and visit us just over the mountain in Bolton Landing. <laughs> Up yonder. <laughs> Up yonder. Thank you. Thanks, Peter, so much.